take a couple of minutes now to build upon what Pierre Lejean told you about regression. Uh, the first topic here, polynomial regression, is actually is actually multiple regression. It's a, it's a, it's simply a form of multiple regression, a form that allows us to fit one or more explanatory variables to a response variable in a nonlinear way. So basically, we are trying to be nonlinear with linear regression. And this will be extremely helpful in some cases, as you will see. So the principle is to add uh, to, uh, let, let's take the simple case where you have one response variable, y, and one explanatory variable, x. Polynomial regression consists in adding higher degree terms of this x explanatory variable. So polynomial terms, x squared, x uh, three, fourth power, and so on. And uh, here, well, you have that uh, uh, intercept term as in usual uh, regression. Now, story could stop here. It's that simple. But there are some points to examine. It's not always so simple, and there are some traps and pitfalls uh, where you are not supposed to fall into. So uh, we'll see this now. So depending on the degree of the polynomial, uh, second, third, and zero, you obtain a regression called regression of order two or three, and so on. Uh, the idea of doing this is to be able to fold the straight line that is actually a model of first degree regression when you have a simple uh, linear regression with one uh, explanatory variable. Each new degree actually adds, adds a fold to the model, so we, it becomes more subtle, see? So let's take this example here with artificial data that I built on purpose for, for it. Uh, clearly, the first degree uh, regression here simply fitting the x, uh, the x variable to the response variable is absolutely unsuccessful. It barely takes up a little bit of a trend because those uh, values here happen to be a little higher on average than those on the other side. But as you see, the adjusted R square, I, uh, now you know what adjusted R square is. The adjusted R square is zero. Uh, it may be, well, uh, this is one little point about, about the adjusted R squared, that consequently to the way it is computed, it may happen that you obtain negative values. But those are, uh, simply cons consider them as zero, okay? It's, it's uh, just depending on the, uh, on the exact mathematics of it, but it, uh, it's not important. In, I mean, uh, as long as you are uh, below zero, consider simply that as a zero value. Um, and of course, if I test the relationship between x and y, I get something highly non-significant in this case. Uh, you know, probably know the code in uh, R to run a simple linear regression, so LM for a linear model, response depending on x. And this is uh, uh, the result uh, when I plot it. If I add a second term, so a second order, second degree uh, polynomial term, x squared, you see that it, the model begins to catch, to capture an appreciable part of the variation in y. Our adjusted R squared has increased to 0 0.23. Uh, it, the model is significant. And well, you see that we have already something interesting here. Note here how I have coded this in R. I have not simply written x plus x squared, because if I did such a thing, R would consider this as uh, an interaction in, in, in terms of, uh, of ANOVA. It, was, it would misinterpret 
the uh, second degree term. So you put it between brackets with this i, meaning as take this as it is. It is an x squared and nothing else. Okay? So don't forget, if you want to run a polynomial regression directly by hand, coding this in r, don't forget this i and the brackets here. So adding a third order term allows us to bring a new fold into our model. And as you see, this further increases the fit here of the model to the data a little bit. R squared is now 0.32 with a p-value very low. So here we have indeed a highly significant model. And uh, as you see, I have added the third polynomial term as before with the i and the x uh, and the third power here. Should I continue? I shall. I shall continue here up to the fourth degree here of, uh, of x. And here, obviously, I have still gained something. R square is 9, or, or almost 0.7. And of course, the p-value gives a highly significant model. And then, should I still go on? That may become a problem. So at some point, we'll see that you have to put some stopping rules to this play. Because otherwise, your model, for one, becomes extremely cumbersome. Uh, it actually, it, 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 it quickly goes out of hand, because you cannot uh, interpret the various terms. And then, of course, there lurks the risk of overfitting that uh, Professor Escardi, uh, Professor Escardi uh, mentioned yesterday. Overfitting is always a risk. It's a risk in statistics as well as in uh, machine learning. So at this point, let us stop here. It looks like, really, we have captured everything that may be interesting in this uh, data and perhaps even some more, but well, in any case, uh, it looks good for now. So this is for the principle. Uh, the first problem with this simple way of doing it may be that polynomial terms of a vari variable, when you, put, when you square an x variable, for instance, those terms are highly correlated so, uh, to one another. So here, for instance, if I construct an xx variable here by uh, asking for 100 values extracted from a, a uniform distribution with a range uh, between 0 and 10, and I correlate this variable to its uh, squared values, I get this. 96%. If you run this same piece of code, of course, you will obtain slightly different values because each of your runs will uh, end up with different random values. But the, uh, the general idea is this. Those two terms are extremely correlated. You don't like this in regression because when you have highly correlated uh, explanatory variables, then the regression coefficients uh, that are computed on those variables become unstable. What do we mean by unstable? It's simply that in a real situation where you have several, uh, and it's not only true for uh, variables uh, that are squared and so on, but in general cases, uh, it's, a, it's a problem in, in, a, in multiple regression when you have a bunch of variables that are highly, highly correlated among uh, uh, others, then the risk is that from one sample to the other in the same statistical population, you can get regression coefficients that are widely different from one sample to the other. This is the instability that is referred to here. So it's a risk in general terms. I just uh, here uh, mention it in, in this case because we are here speaking of, uh, of polynomial regression, but it's a general risk. So uh, again, this refer to the excellent advice of uh, uh, Michele Scardi of yesterday uh, when he 
advised to resort to sound ecological thinking. So before throwing into your models any variable simply because it may be interesting, first think of those that may be most interesting and possibly check whether a couple of them do not tell approximately the same story, which may be the case, for instance, in vegetation science when you have different means of uh, assessing uh, nitrogen in soils, which is a difficult task. So you may have different possibilities, or phosphorus, total phosphorus or uh, uh, other, uh, other forms. And then, well, of course, we have, we have the different values, so just throw in the, 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 uh, the, the, variable, the corresponding variables in the equations. And no, this is not good because you run into this problem. But this is a little bit broader than the, the question here of polynomial uh, regression. But in any case, it's also lurking here. So you have a couple of possibilities. Because when you have different variables, like in my phosphorus case here, of course, you can uh, resort to thinking or possibly test one and the other and decide to, take, to retain only one. This is possible uh, uh, on the basis of thinking. But here, we are stuck with the problem. We want to keep both. So we must find a means to avoid the, this uh, correlation. So there is a first easy way of, well, alleviating the problem without eliminating it completely, except from, uh, in, in, in some uh, really limited cases. And this is simply to, to uh, center the x variable before uh, squaring it and putting it in on third uh, and so on and so forth. But at least for the second degree, when you, uh, when you center the variables, then after that, your uh, second term will be almost uncorrelated to the, uh, to, to, to the first degree, at least as long as the variable is reasonably symmetrical in its distribution. When it's perfectly symmetrical in its, di in its distribution, then the second term is perfectly uh, non-correlated with the first degree, uh, as long as you have those uh, usual uh, mild asymmetries, then you are not completely uncorrelated, but at least it helps a lot, and you can uh, certainly work with such a case here. The other, more general possibility, which is fortunately offered in a very easy, easy way in R, is to use orthogonal polynomials. So mathematical literature uh, offers a couple of possibility to, 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 uh, to scale. And well, the principle begins also with the centering of the, the x variable. But then you have various manipulations and computations. So you obtain polynomials, first, second, third, uh, and, and fourth degree in this case, that are non-correlated to one another. As you see here, uh, I have asked here for a polynomial of fourth degree of my variable x. And here I have correlated all those resulting terms uh, uh, to one another. And what I obtain is, of course, here in the, uh, the di diagonal, it's uh, the values themselves correlated with themselves. It's, uh, a correlation matrix here, and everything else is zero, okay, to the machine uh, precision here when you are at minus 17, you are at zero. So this is the most elegant way to resort to polynomial uh, regression. And in terms of R squared, you don't lose anything. It's equivalent to using the non-orthogonal -poly uh, non polynomials. It works perfectly. And just to show you that it indeed produces the polynomial that you want, this one, I have used uh, those four uh, terms that I have obtained here and simply plot them, plotted them uh, against x, which is my original variable. So you see that the first degree has been somehow centered. You see that uh, now, instead of having from 0 to 10, you have something that is centered around 0. Uh, it has been centered. And then the second degree is uh, this, and the third one is this, and the fourth one is this. So we indeed have all the terms with all the folds that we need to adjust our data as well as possible. But now, as Pierre suggested uh, earlier, is, really, uh, is it really the aim 
to get to the perfect nirvana of an R square equal to 1 in our data. You know, when people are extremely uh, proud and come to me and, yes, I get this and that analysis, and I have an R square of 0.95, 98, yeah, ooh, this gets me nervous. Uh, I'm practically certain that there is something wrong <laughs> somewhere in the process. And I think I, <laughs> I well, I, I, I never found a, a real situation where uh, something sound had, had been done and you get such a thing. In, in, well, natural variation is such huge that it's uh, simply not possible. So uh, you probably erred in the direction of too many explanatory variables. Of course, uh, the reason why with, uh, as in Pierre's example, he had 100 points, or Pedro's example, 100 points, and you add 99 random variables, and then you obtain an R square equal to 1. The simple geometrical reason is that you need 99 dimensions to uh, position 100 points, one uh, against the others, you know, to, to position two points, uh, you, you need only one dim dimension, which gives you the, the distance between two points in an absolute, not as a, in, a, in, in reference of a, an external referential, but one uh, in function of the other. You, you need one dim dimension for two points. You need two dimensions for three points. Okay, you always can fit the plane uh, in three points, and so on and so forth. Hence, the n minus one degrees of freedom you all, all, always start with in any uh, data set. So if you have 100 points and 99 uh, degrees of freedom in your model, well, you just uh, it, it just amounts to a uh, transformation of the, of the data in terms of your, your new variables. But you have as many dimensions. Uh, you provide as many possibilities to fit your data as you have dimensions uh, to start with. So you don't, so uh, as Pierre uh, put it, you explain everything with nothing. Okay, that's the reason. So we have to avoid this. Keep this in mind in general cases, not only here for polynomial regression. But now, what is the use of polynomial regression in ecology? Uh, a remark, of course, a preliminary uh, remark here, is that I present this now in the frame of multiple regression with one single response variable because this is a two-day's topic. But of course, uh, as uh, with uh, the, the presentation uh, made by Pierre earlier today, this is because we will need this in the multivariate frame uh, from tomorrow on in RDA and in CCA. So. Uh, Basically, we know that frequently species have uni show unimodal responses to a uh, gradient, to an ecological gradient, to a constraint of uh, maybe against temperature or uh, calcium content or whatever, pH. Okay, so you have something like uh, uh, an optimum of the species where you will find most uh, individuals per square meter or what uh, your measure was, uh, or grams per, per square meter if, you, if, if it comes to biomass. And then, of course, uh, and, uh, when you get farther away from this optimum, then you have less individuals because the conditions are more difficult. So this is the basis of this unimodal response. Using a second-order polynomial term provides you that possibility to put that necessary fold in your model for that uh, situation to capture this feature, this unimodal feature. So using a regression uh, with a second order term, but still keeping the first order, is a way to capture any linear trend. Linear trend in this context probably generally meaning that you have not captured the whole range of your species when uh, along the trend. You, you, you cannot uh, switch into the multivariate case. Of course, when you, when you uh, sample communities, uh, you will 
most likely sample a part of the species in the whole range of their uh, presence, hence the zeros outside this range on both sides, and a part of those species may be uh, at, at, at the left or at the right part of the range, and you capture only part of this unimodal uh, response. So if you are just a little bit at the edge, like in this example here, we have captured probably most of it at the left part, but not quite here in, at the right part. And of course, there's still some variability here. So the linear part may still be useful to uh, make the adjustment a little bit better to, to, to take this uh, slight asymmetry into account. And of course, here, the second degree term will capture uh, the parabolic uh, shape here of uh, the response curve. So uh, this is the basic reason why we could be interested in using polynomial regression in ecology. Uh, if, we, if we do it in a multivariate term uh, uh, case, uh, like uh, tomorrow or uh, next day in RDA, then we could use that uh, procedure uh, to improve our modeling. So uh, you can also verify, you could, if you are working on one single species, since we are in a, a regression today, I'll now go to these cases where we have a, a single response variable. You can combine those. It's easy to plot uh, uh, scatter plots between your response variable and all the uh, explanatory variables in turn. If you observe that for one given explanatory variable, you seem to have a linear response here, uh, maybe you are at one end of the, uh, you know, of the gradient here, and you have something that is maybe not quite linear, but at least reasonably uh, uh, monotonic here, uh, then you can dispense with the, the second order. Of course, it would be useless here. So uh, in this case, I uh, would uh, have here uh, my model. I would put it with a linear rela relationship. While here in this case, I would keep the second order term, or put in, add the second order term to have the unimodal relationship. So it's perfectly possible, of course, to combine a linear a model for one of the explanatory variable and a unimodal one for a second order for the, uh, the other one. OK, until now, up to now. Fine. Now, uh, of course, this is uh, at least uh, when you work on it. Uh, maybe you have time to do so, or you want to do so, because you are very careful about one particular species, and you can uh, you can afford the time to to go in that uh, in that direction. But another possibility also is to resort to some kind of variable selection. I'll come to that uh, at another point in this course, variable selection. But uh, the way of actually finding automatically which degree is the best fit for your model, for your variables, for your explanatory variables, would be at the outset to provide the uh, model with the second terms. So here, if I have a situation with uh, my response variable here and three explanatory variables here, I build a model, a regression model, with the second term for x1, x2, and x3. So this would be complete. Well, you could go even further and uh, build interaction terms or a combination where you multiply the, the, the different terms. I'll not go into that for now. Let's simply consider each of the explanatory variables separately. But in any case, this already gives you something more consistent. But as we saw in the previous slide, it's not nece always necessary. So there are ways of selecting the variable that really contribute to the model here. And if you use, uh, apply one of those variable selection pr uh, procedures, you may, for instance, 
end up with the elimination of those two terms, which is, this is completely fictitious, of course, but it, it could happen that for one term you have uh, only the, the squared value because you happen to have sampled your, uh, your species uh, at the, in the complete range of this explanatory variable, and so uh, your, your unimodal response shape is completely symmetrical, so you don't need the first degree. Uh, here, it, would be, it could be the reverse, meaning you have something uh, uh, monotonic, and in the third variable, you could have use both to uh, uh, obtain an optimal fit for your, uh, for your model. So, at the end, you have a thinned model, a thinned out model, a re reduced model here, where you have kept only those variables that are uh, adequate, that are significant. Of course, there are tests associated with this. We'll see all this tomorrow uh, uh, with a model that has a much better fit than a model built only on the first degree variables. It's up to the point that even in, uh, in RDA, we recommend, in, especially in early phases when you are a bit, a bit at an exploratory stage of your study, to use, to add those polyno second degree, at least second degree polynomial terms to all your uh, environmental variables to be able to even eventually uh, identify those situations where a second degree may be useful. So second degree is easy to interpret. As you saw, uh, uh, it has an, uh, uh, an obvious role to play when you have a unimodal response. Third degree may still be useful because, well, it's an approximation, but if your response uh, looks like this because you are slightly asymmetrical. Maybe, well, you may have uh, the first degree that captures part of it, but then a third degree may produce such a thing here. This is not fully appropriate, of course, and by no means you could extrapolate such a model out of the range where it has been fitted. But this is also a general rule in regression. You model, your, and maybe, well, outside regression as well, when you calibrate a model, when you determine its parameters within a certain range of your variables, the model is valid inside this range, but not outside. And Pierre has an extremely uh, funny example of this. Uh, you may have noticed in the material for uh, today something about Miss America, uh, an undernourished uh, nourished model. What is, what is, uh, what is this? Uh, actually, the, the, the idea here was precisely to, to, to give you some, uh, some idea of what happens when you extrapolate a model, because basically uh, the, the ratio between height and weight of Miss America has tended to decrease. Uh, during the 20th century. And if, if you fit a linear model here and go to 2016, uh, your Miss America is really, really undernourished as to have negative weights, okay? Uh, something like that. So uh, it's, it's the danger of extrapolation. You can always interpolate, meaning you are within the range, but don't extrapolate. Uh, otherwise, it's, it, it becomes a very uh, risky business. So, uh, uh, well, for my example here, the third degree may be um, marginally useful, but those, uh, you can hardly go beyond that in ecology without, uh, well, I mean, of course, as I have shown you, you can always uh, add up and fit a little bit more. But it makes no point going beyond uh, the degree that you can explain. And if you want to go progressively from first to second to third degree to fourth degree uh, that way, it's always a possibility to test if the addition of a new term brings significant, uh, something significant to the R-square. So the, added, uh, the gain in R-square is significant. You can test this. It's easy to do in R, and in my um, uh, script, uh, for, for this afternoon, there is a procedure. I show you how to do this. It's also in, in Pierre's uh, 
uh, material actually, uh, that part I think I, I, I took from Pierre's material, just adapted it a, a little bit with a small example where you add terms and then uh, at some point it stops to be, the addition stops to be significant. But th this is, as always, I prefer first res uh, resorting to sound ecological thinking and uh, if you really don't have particular reasons to stop at some point, then, well, you, you can resort to statistical testing to, to, to see where you are supposed or when you can stop or not. Another, uh, okay, always, uh, you know, if you have a question and simply raise the hand, I'm very likely to not see the hand. And this is because physiologically uh, our sensory system is made to detect changes, not constant values. This is why, for instance, frogs, when they wait for their mosquitoes to pass by, are completely, uh, they don't move at all, because even the eyes don't move. So when the mosquito goes here, there, you have a sudden change, and it reacts extremely happily and captures uh, the mosquito uh, or the dragonfly. Uh, and we are, we are built the same way. Constant signals like uh, the, the pressure of our or friction of our uh, uh, clothes uh, or well uh, the smell in in this room you don't feel this anymore because this is, these are constants. So if you make this with your hand, I'm likely to see the movement because this is a change. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Pierre briefly mentioned trend surface analysis before. Transurface analysis is a particular use of polynomial regression where the basic explanatory variables are spatial coordinates. In the simplest case, if you are along the transect, it's the, it is the first example that I showed you with the folds uh, in, adding up uh, up to the fourth degree. Uh, so you could, this, uh, you could do this on a one-dimensional transect. But here, I'm specially uh, speaking of a, sec uh, a two-dimensional, uh, well, on an area, okay? You have a couple of, uh, uh, some of sites. And you have your, your, your sites on an area, and you have their x, y coordinates. So you have those two variables uh, that you could use here as a first-order uh, polynomial. Well, it's not, not yet polynomial, but in any, any case, you have your binomial uh, term here, x and y. And this... Uh, using this is equivalent to fitting a plane across your uh, data. So if you, maybe if your uh, area, your sampling area was this room and you had uh, samples uh, distributed, uh, maybe randomly, don't need to be systematical, of course, randomly across this room, and your response variable happens to be, uh, ha have larger values there and smaller there, for instance, then fitting a plane would give something that goes up in this direction, which is a combination of x and y. So uh, this is a simple way. A very crude way, uh, I agree, but a very useful way in some circumstances, as I will mention later. But then you could envision, and this, at the early stages of our thinking about uh, capturing and modeling spatial structures in ecological data, we went along this line, order two, order three here, uh, and uh, this was actually at the basis of our paper in 1992 about uh, partitioning, variation partitioning in multivariate case, where uh, we had one explanatory matrix made with environmental variables, and the other one made of coordinates and their second and uh, third degree, third order uh, form here. So this was what we had at that time. Uh, so, uh, of course, things have now uh, drastically changed. We have uh, other possibilities, as you will see in the two last days of this course. But nevertheless, you have that possibility. And the, uh, adding the second uh, order here also adds a fold in both directions. You see, you can have a fold in this one and another one in, that, uh, in the other direction. And uh, since you, you have the, the possibility here of even multiplying both, like in usual uh, uh, polynomial, 
construction, then uh, you have the possibility of, uh, say, for instance, a uniform uh, bump here at the middle of the, or somewhere in the, in the room, or a saddle shaped, so maybe this way, and then that way in the other direction. Of, okay, so this gives you one more fold. And the third order, one more uh, fold again in both directions. But as you see, it becomes rapidly extremely cumbersome. For a third degree polynomial, you have nine terms here. Not counting the, the intercept, nine terms. Of course, you can resort to variable selection, and uh, as, as I explained earlier, you can uh, try to select those that are significant. But in any case, you have a large number of term, terms quickly, and even for the third degree, it, be, it, it still is an extremely crude way of uh, modeling very broad scale spatial structure. So uh, we shall not go any further here uh, because much uh, more, more powerful uh, methods exist to analyze spatial patterns, and we will come to them. <laughs> yes, Cosimo. <laughs> I think in, um, for a while about this question. I always been told uh, that in order to apply multiple regression, mm -hmm. Your variable must be normally distributed. Ah! Ah! <laughs> Urban myth! Urban myth! Urban myth! <laughs> okay, I'm extremely happy that you remind me because I thought of that uh, one hour again, but ago, but forgot to, to mention it. Okay, the requirement about normality is about the residuals of your model the residuals of the model. One way to obtain this normality of residual may be to normalize the response variable. But there's absolutely no reason to do anything about the explanatory variables. And the proof being in the pudding, uh, Pierre mentioned earlier that a regression, a multiple regression, could be constructed with dummy 0, 1 binary variables, which are, of course, absolutely not normal. But take the extremely simple case where you have one response variable, y, and one dummy variable simply, uh, uh, well, separating, uh, actually separating your, two, uh, your, your, your data set into two groups. This actually is equivalent to the famous, if you run it uh, classically with, an, uh, with a simple regression, it's the exact equivalent of running a t-test for two groups, for the means. So what are the residuals? If you have two groups, say, uh, I, I, I draw them separately here on, my, uh, on this. You have uh, you have two groups of data with the, the same response variable here, but one group has a mean here, uh, observed mean, and the other one has an observed mean that is here. Okay? The requirement for normality is for the residuals. Why? Because here, what are the residuals? The residuals are the deviations from the respective means. So running your regression amounts to superimpose here. You actually, it's like centering your two groups upon their respective means, so both become zero, and you have something like this. And uh, the model being here, this is the common mean, actually. And, uh, of course, the test is whether this here is significantly, significantly different from zero, but uh, be it or not, the residuals here are simply the, the superimposition of those two curves here. And if this is normally distributed, then you are in business. But of course, my 0, 1 variables is absolutely not normal. And this is not, it does not have to be. So this is an extreme case, but just to show you. <laughs> okay, so it's a, uh, well, it was a, I think it's a, it's a thing we should uh, repeat as a mantra in, in, in all courses. Variables don't have to be normal, it's the residuals. And that holds for ANOVA, that holds for multiple regression, that holds for 
And the thing when you, you call for normality, concerns uh, actually conserve the residuals. And this is, of course, in the purpose of, yeah, this is another point that I can add. This is for a purpose of a parametric test. So if you use, if you want to use the T uh, distribution, student's T distribution to, to, to test your difference between means or your model of regression, then this normality is a requirement. If, like we will do in RDA and CCA, if you test by permutation, permutations, then you don't even have to uh, hold to this requirement of normality of residuals because permutations will take care of that by generating uh, their own uh, reference distribution. Some other requirements, but then, no, I, I go not further into this, but you'll see that uh, it doesn't mean that uh, permutation tests mean it's a free-for-all. You have to be careful about some other points uh, because when permutation tests were invented, many people thought, yes, I can do anything I want since I generate my own reference distribution. <laughs> Who cares? No, it's not the case. In, in ANOVA or in comparison of two groups, for instance, you still have to verify that the two variances are uh, um, homogeneous or two or more K variances for ANOVA are uh, homogeneous. And this is the reason why I did not build this example with something like this, uh, which could not even be submitted to a permutation test. It wouldn't uh, work. Uh, you would, have the, you would uh, go into the... Uh, how is it called? The, the, Berens Fischer problem, yes, thank you. Berens Fischer problem, you, you still ho uh, go into that problem. But in any case, uh, well, we are out of, uh, out of the subject here, but thank you for having asked this question because it's extremely important that everybody understands this, okay? Normality is for residuals. Paint it on your walls, uh, above your bed, and uh, remember it. As I told you before, one useful, still now extremely useful use of, well, polynomial between brackets, actually, uh, uh, regression in ecology is the trending. In, uh, uh, we'll see in the last days of this course that we have to identify spatial structures. But actually, not only, in, in most cases, those spatial structures that interest us because they are most difficult to bring out are those that are at intermediate spatial scales, not the ones that cover the whole surface. Which be, uh, those ones may be a general trend because there is something larger, uh, processes larger than your uh, sampling area that uh, produces a trend within your area. Biogeographical uh, trends, for instance, could produce such an effect. They are beyond, they act at scales that are beyond your sampling scale, but uh, never, or your area, but nevertheless, they produce a trend within your area. Now, the methods, uh, most methods in, uh, for identifying spatial structures, including the ones we develop to identify those uh, structures at all scales, work better or work at all if a condition called stationarity is um, respected, satisfied. Now, to be very uh, simple about that, that stationarity basically means that at every, every point on your surface, uh, the differences between close values if you take two, two close values there and there and there and there and there and there and there, and there, and there and you average those values plus minus, the, that must be zero. And you must have a finite variance over the area so that you, you don't have something widely different in different areas. So basically, you can obtain something very close to that and satisfy conditions for most of the tests we are uh, running, uh, or they are running in uh, geographical or geology, for instance, in, in those uh, in, in different tests for spatial structures, when you remove those broad scale trends from the data before running those, uh, those tests. Another reason, and now specific to what we have developed in terms of uh, DBMEMs and MEMs that uh, we'll address later, is that 
yes, those methods are able to capture broad scale trends. But they, shall w they will waste many variables because those variables we, we will create are basically sine waves or something like this. So it's ex extremely cumbers uh, cumbersome and actually useless to try to model uh, something linear with a bunch of, uh, of sine waves. <laughs> okay, it works. <laughs> we tried it, but then you use half of those we, you have already uh, created just to model this, and uh, this is of course a linear trend is easily uh, removed from the data beforehand. So this is another use. Of course, it's a, it's a first-order polynomial, but I included this notion here because it just uh, fitted in the in the general uh, pattern here. So. This is, as I told you before, equivalent to do this, to doing this. You, uh, you fit a model, you fit uh, first order, x, y, and uh, z being your response variable, and uh, you use your x, y coordinates as explanatory variables, N nothing else, test if it is significant, and remove, well, Sometimes we, we test it. Some in other in other cases we simply use it and, uh, and decide that we will everything uh, want everything flat. And so uh, uh, what you retain are the residuals which are here represented by those vertical uh, here lines uh, above and below the plane that I have fitted on my surface. Okay. This all this may already be known by many of you. Collectively, I'm quite sure that everybody knows a, li a little bit of everything that I have counted. Now, yesterday, last night, I decided to include a couple of more slides about another use of polynomial regression that has been uh, presented by Caillot Terbrac in a uh, book that he published with uh, uh, two uh, co-authors in '95, which was one of our reference books at the early ages of canonical uh, ordination. And this is a use of how to be able to run a Gaussian regression, so a regression fitting a normal cur curve on species abundance data. You know, those kind of data with a unimodal resp response, actually, the, the, the true model is not the coarse uh, second degree polynomial. Uh, that I showed you because it would predict ne negative abundances at both ends of, uh, of the distribution. The real model here, if the, the, the distribution is, is symmetric around uh, the optimum here, uh, would be a normal curve, curve like this. You can do this easily. You have, well, for, to do that, you have first to transform your uh, response data, your abundances, into logs. Because fitting a second degree polynomial function on <coughs> log transformed data is equivalent, and then you can go from one to the other, to fitting a normal model, a normal curve, to the corresponding raw data. So this is how you do it. Let's show you here, well, the, some words in French because I, I borrowed this last minute yesterday, yesterday from uh, another course I'm giving. Um, so you have here a fictitious uh, species for the French-speaking people. I've called it bidonia, uh, bidonia because it's uh, une espèce bidon, quoi. <laughs> uh, a species that doesn't exist. Well, uh, so you have the distribution here, a fake species, actually. Uh, so you have here a fictitious uh, series of, of, of sites here along uh, a wetness uh, gradient or water content, soil water content uh, gradient here where I've captured uh, just about the, the, the whole gradient. So these are the, uh, the, the true values here. You see the raw abundances. The, second, uh, the, the first step is to, uh, well, you transform the data to uh, could be Napierian logs, uh, usually it's what we use, of uh, y plus 1. Uh, this transformation is so often used in ecology that in R, in the standard R installation, uh, you can uh, 
So uh, yp, for instance, y prime, could be log 1p of y. Log 1p does exactly that. So you don't have to, to, to write log uh, y plus 1. If you, if you write log 1p, it does the same uh, job automatically. This is uh, uh, just uh, information here. OK, so you have now the logs. And you fit your second degree uh, polynomial uh, equation to these log transform data. And now we will work with the B0, B1, B2 uh, terms. Well, actually, B1 and B2. Well, B0 as well for the last stage. You take those. And now, with B1 and B2, you can compute the value of the optimum of your species, meaning along this x-axis, this value here uh, is, uh, is the u. Uh, and you obtain this from those regression coefficients. You can also compute what in ecology we would call the tolerance of that species around uh, this optimum. Tolerance being here defined, of course, it's one definition. You could multiply it by two if you are very generous. Uh, tolerance being defined as one standard deviation on both sides here. So uh, this is, again, obtained, but uh, this time only with the B2, uh, B2 coefficients. You don't need the other one. Uh, so that uh, second important feature of your species distribution can be obtained in this simple way. And the third, third and last one is the abundance at the optimum. So here, C, so we have tolerance here, and C, the abundance at the optimum. It's that easy. I did not take, my t take time uh, last night to write a little R function that would do this automatically for you. But I suggest you, for those interested in writing uh, our functions, to do it as an exercise. Right? And finally, well, here I have only the, the model, not the, the data. I didn't uh, uh, put it back into this, uh, this uh, representation here. But you have here the, those terms. And of course, to draw the, the, uh, the, the curve itself, you just insert those parameters that we just computed, uh, C, uh, uh, U, and T, uh, you, you just uh, put them into the, uh, the, probability, the, the normal probability, probability uh, density function here. OK? When I read this the first time, I nice, how elegant. <laughs> mm. Now, of course, as I told you already, uh, polynomial regression has its limits. So avoid the use of, I'm um, just a little bit summarizing what I have told you up to now, avoid the use of higher order polynomials if you cannot explain them ecologically. Okay? So, so second term, okay, second degree, third degree to some extent, but hmm, further than that it becomes a little bit uh, strange because you, well, I'm not sure whether you have a really clear explanation of that. And if you prefer using an, object, an objective criterion, then, uh, as I, I told you uh, also, add degrees, but test the added explained variance at each step and stop if nothing uh, significant uh, is added in terms of R squared. And <laughs> beware of overfitting. So uh, this is uh, the, the, the situation that I explained with uh, Pedro's example. I, I took up Pedro's example that Pierre mentioned earlier. Uh, so uh, you don't explain. Uh, beware to explain uh, <laughs> everything with nothing. <laughs> <laughs>